Irrelevant, Hoplite replied. I am a Hoplite. I don't have a name. By the pillars, what was she supposed to do? Continuing to call him Hoplite after these revelations felt so wrong. Almost like she was perpetuating the crime done to him by the Eighth Arm. She almost insisted that he tell her, so she could use the true name given to him rather than the title he'd been branded with. Yet she hesitated. Given his earlier state of mind, she was unsure. If he would stay stable as she pressed him, what if he lashed out in a fury once more at her incessant questioning? No, she would need to be patient. She'd wait until she was certain that he was completely calm. She'd seen this kind of thing before, from the escaped slaves of Ument. They had refused, even after attaining freedom, to go by anything aside from the titles their masters had given them. She had known people that had been taken by Umant, that had returned as shells once their ransoms were paid, and their ears clipped. Even once they finally tasted freedom, they refused to go by their old names, because slaves were tools. The names had been beaten out of them permanently. Hoplite, with all his might and power, was viewed as merely a slave by this eighth arm. Not as a hero or valiant warrior, but a slave. Michael might not think so. But she had a feeling that he was an outlier amongst his people. The boy was rude, brash, and arrogant beyond belief, with a vulgar sense of humor as the cherry on top. That wasn't to say that she disliked him. There was something charming about the assishnesses of the boy. Certainly he was an exception. There was no way that the other Marines behaved as he did. What was it that you wanted? She asked. I doubt that you as a child wanted to be taken from your mother. My emotions at the time were irrelevant, he replied curtly. She was just a woman who gave birth to me. Nothing more. Nothing more? Just the woman that gave birth to him. What kind of twisted warping of the mind had been inflicted upon him? She was gonna feel sick. He needed more help than she had thought. Yet, how was she supposed to do that? She was no thought-bearer. She was a warrior. She wasn't cut out for reversing indoctrination. Especially when it was this intense. The thought-bearers back in the forward had a hard enough time rehabilitating Umanti slave elves and none of them had ever been in servitude for nearly as long as Hoplite. What made it even harder, though, was that Hoplite seemed to prefer living this way. He wanted someone above him to tell him what needed to be done. That was why he was so insistent on reuniting with his comrades. It wasn't just so he could save their lives. It was that he merely wanted to return to being a slave. She grit her teeth still hiding the tears from Hoplite with her face in her hands. Lancelot was certainly not a thought-bearer, true, but she wasn't going to be. The best thing to do here was show Hoplite that there was more to life than being a tool. She could subtly guide him to those trains of thought and let him just come to those conclusions on his own. If she tried to force him to think differently, then he'd dig his heels in like the stubborn ass he was. She almost laughed. Donkeys were far less stubborn than this man. This idea might actually prove fruitful. Already he seemed more thoughtful and considering than he had been when they first met. It's nothing to cry about, he stated flatly. Lance froze for a brief instant before she replied. I'm not crying. She was proud of how steady her voice was. It lent a lot of power to the lie that it was. Are you tired already? Hoplite asked. I thought you slept back at the celebration. I did. I just... My eyes are dry. I'm keeping them closed for a bit. She said after a brief instant of hesitation. 
You shouldn't leave them open for so long, remember to blink. He told her, I have the same problem on missions. Her brow furrowed at those words, and after a moment, she started laughing. Of course he wouldn't remember to blink. The man needed to be reminded to sleep. I didn't make a joke. He said, No, of course not. She laughed. You don't make jokes, right? She lifted her head from her hands finally, wiping away her tears as she continued giggling. She tried to play off the moistness of her eyes as it being from her uncontrollable chuckling, using a single finger to wipe them away as Hoplite watched, unmoving. She didn't even understand herself why this seemed so funny. Perhaps it was just his deadpan delivery that really sold it. Remember to blink. She said in a mocking monotone before she burst out laughing again. Shh. Ah, Alistair hissed from his bedroll, violently turning to face away from she and Hoplite. She stifled her giggling, clearing her throat as she wiped away the last of her tears. Had she been laughing that loudly? She thought she was barely audible, but perhaps this dome chamber carried sound better than she had originally thought. Uh, what was so funny? Hoplite didn't understand it. All he had done was remind her to blink every now and again. There was no humor to be found in it. Sure, it went without saying that he wasn't an expert on comedy, but her reaction seemed completely unfounded. The sentence had been delivered in his normal tone of voice. There was no funny inflection or anything like it. He pondered this as Lance regained control of her faculties, her chest heaving as she tried to repress the laughter that still threatened to spill out. She continued to wipe away tears, new ones forming along with every shake of her shoulders. Absolute insanity. It couldn't just be that he didn't get the joke. This journey had already managed to crack her mental health. They'd only just begun. What if this got worse? and she became a liability, or even worse, a danger. He pursed his lips as he considered. Was he just jumping to conclusions? Maybe it would be best to simply ask her what she had found so funny about his words. Once he did, Lance just gently shook her head. When you said that you forget to blink, she said with a smile. He stared. That's it. She told him with a shrug. It's just funny that you forget to blink. I don't understand, he said honestly. What about that is comical. Again, she shrugged. It just is. I can't give you specifics. His brow furrowed. I just told you that I forget on occasion. That isn't a joke. Not everything has to be a joke to be funny, Hops. She said, grinning. Ah, oh, pss. Hops. What was she doing? It was highly inappropriate to be giving nicknames to people without their consent. Right as he was about to voice this complaint, Elam sat up, glaring at them both beneath a furious brow. Can you both, please? For the love of the pillars, shut your mouths. He said in a barely polite tone, We have a horribly long day ahead of us, and I'd rather not be exhausted for it. Hoplite then stood, Lance copying the motion without thinking, We'll move further away. He replied. Ilum huffed, but said nothing, laying back down and turning away from them in his blankets. Lance looked up at him curiously, and he responded by turning, walking off toward one of the far walls. He wouldn't allow himself to be outside of Twindle's range, but he'd go to the edge of it so he could continue to speak without disrupting anyone's rest. It was like Lance had said earlier, the more rested they were, the less they'd complain in the morning once they set out. 
Again, the two of them sat, and a long silence passed before Lance asked, What do you want to speak of now? Hoplite considered. What else could he learn from Lance today before everyone awoke? He looked from her to Twindle, then back again. Twindle's pillar god is a part of the knowledge pillar. Not foundation, but she can cast magic. He asked. Lance nodded. It's a tad bit more complicated in her case. She's a paladin of Athena. Tranquility. She stopped for a moment, thinking. She doesn't access Foundation directly. Athena does it for her. It's sort of like building a house. But I think since Athena is the one providing the Foundation, Twindle doesn't have to build anything. She can just cast whenever she wants, with no drawbacks. Hoplite asked. If the Pillar God was handling all the casting, then that could explain why the aura was ongoing while Twindle slept. If it was still going, he reminded himself. It was still unknown to him if it really was still active with her being unconscious. Yet it made a certain amount of sense. She didn't have to maintain the magic if she wasn't really the one casting. Paladins can cast safely without any problems. But there are a couple catches I know about. Lance said, leaning a chin into a palm. First off, they're limited to what spells they can use, as their pillar god will only allow a certain kind. Athena wouldn't allow Twindle to throw fireballs or anything of that sort since she is supposed to represent peace and harmony. That aura she's casting. That's specific to Athena. No other house could use it unless someone used raw foundation to make it so. So, Twindle isn't really a mage at all. He said, she's just borrowing Athena's power. Pretty much. Lance confirmed. You said there was a couple drawbacks to this kind of casting. He continued, what is the other one? A paladin has a code of conduct. All of them are very strict and vary from God to God. If a paladin follows that code to the letter, they won't have any problems. But if they break it, they become shunned by their pillar god and can no longer rely on them for casting. Lance replied, they could just serve another deity. Hoplite said. Lance shook her head. No other pillar god would take them if they did. If a paladin breaks their oaths, no other pillar would take them in. They're viewed as unreliable scum from then on by every other god. So if a paladin broke one oath, they couldn't simply jump to the next god with a new set of rules. They'd be cut off for life. That made sense to him. A soldier that didn't follow orders in one branch was unlikely to do so in others. So is Kitka a paladin of Zod? He asked, gesturing towards the snoring warrior. I don't know, she said with a shrug. Maybe he is? I can't really say. Kitka hadn't really shown off any magical abilities since Hoplite had met him. But perhaps his nice superhuman speed was an effect of serving Zod was every single tongue a paladin of the might pillar. It was doubtful he'd seen other tongues fight before at the broken fiend wall. They were talented fighters, to be sure. But nothing they had done spoke of supernatural aid. They had all fought at standard human level speeds. So it was more likely that paladins of Zod were more rare amongst them. Or perhaps they were completely separate organizations. I've been curious about Kidka myself, actually, but for different reasons. She said, drawing him from his thoughts. He moves and fights like a watcher, Hoplite said. Is that right? She nodded, her eyes shifting to the sleeping Kidka for an instant. Yes, exactly. She confirmed, looking back to him. But he's a human. She said with emphasis. 
Watcher secrets are never given to outsiders. No exceptions. Even with torture? He asked. Again she nodded. Even with torture. If outsiders knew anything about how we operated, it would reduce our capabilities. She continued, if one of our own gets captured by the enemy, they bite off their tongues. She then put a hand to her mouth with a grimace. I'm sure you've noticed in our time together that some of the other watchers never spoke. Hoplite nodded, but he hadn't thought about why they weren't speaking before. So they had been captured and had opted to remove their ability to speak. He seriously doubted that every single watcher who'd ever been captured bit their own tongues off. It took serious mental fortitude to willingly sever a body part. He voiced his doubts, and she nodded. It's true that not every watcher will bite their own tongue upon capture. Usually, they only do so if they believe that escape or rescue is impossible. And before you say negative, it's unlikely anyone would ever bite their tongues off. She mimicked his monotone. A watcher would always prefer self-mutilation over the shame of being the first one to spill watcher secrets. In fact, death would be preferable. He then gestured to Kitka. Then why does he know how to fight like one? Hoplite had spent plenty of time fighting with watchers during his short campaign in the Fullwood when the wood was flooded with a legion of fiends. As such, he'd become familiar with the way they fought. Kitka matched every single detail Hoplite had observed, down to the way he gripped his sword. There was no way that he didn't learn it from someone among their number. Lance fell silent, her lips pulling tight as she glared up at him. That's what I want to figure out, she said after a moment, her brow creasing. Yet every attempt I've made to pry the truth from him has been fruitless. I do not want to torture him, mind you, but this isn't something I can allow to go unsolved. What if this rogue watcher is going about teaching other humans about our ways? I need their names so justice can be delivered. Justice can be delivered? Would the Watchers execute this owl soldier or merely imprison them? If they handled their courts as the Eighth Arm did, then he'd be executed. Publicly, of course. As Lord Jin commanded be done to traitors. Yet, the Elves were not subject to turn and laws. Perhaps they would simply imprison him for life. As for Kidka, what would be intended for him? He seriously doubted that the Hark Hall would suffer him to live after he'd learned those secrets. Why hadn't Lance mentioned this to the Hark Hall before? She had the opportunity to before they'd left the Fallwood. Could it be that she didn't want to indirectly kill him? He asked this very question, and she frowned, falling silent for a long moment before finally she said, I'm only pretty sure that he was taught by one of us. She sighed but pretty sure isn't good enough for me to tell the Harkall about him. He'd be hunted down until the day he died. I have to know for certain, else the guilt will eat at me for the rest of time. It still might after the fact, but this isn't something I can let go. This was surprising coming from Lance. She was usually more altruistic than this, or so it had seemed yet. He respected her for it. This was her duty and letting secrets fall into enemy hands was intolerable. He did not think that Kidka deserved to die, of course. He had done nothing wrong thus far. And surprisingly, Hoplite wasn't sure if he'd allow the young man to be killed. Why was that? He struggled to come up with a logical answer, but found nothing justifiable as he racked his brain. A strange desire then filled him as he continued to stare at Lance. Something that made him horribly uncomfortable. He desired to assist her in this objective. He wasn't quite sure as to why he wanted this. Maybe it was because she was helping him with his own goals. 
She was putting her life on the line to come into the Fiendwood with him after all. This concerned him, though, for desiring to help someone else with a task was another dire sign of him. Soaring. Still, if it would help keep Lance's mind off the dangers of their surroundings, then it might be worth the effort. Also, what if Kidka was innocent? What if his fighting style was just incredibly similar to that of a watcher? Once more, he compared Lance's form to Kidka's, brow furrowing as he thought. It wasn't an exact copy at all. There were slight differences here and there. The way his feet had moved.